because that's something I'm famous for is not recording or forgetting to record. Um, so, um, yes, so um, the idea is that this will be uh, very, very introductory and, um, uh, yeah, in regards to getting to know you a little bit better, um, what I like to do is uh, in the first week or two of the course is actually get a, uh, take a bit of time to catch up with you all individually. So make, we'll make a time during the next week or two weeks to have a chat um, just one-to-one -one on Zoom and uh, that way I can just ask you a few questions and get to know you a bit better. Um, and you know and help you guide you maybe a little bit towards where you want to go with regards to your courses and your careers and, and also with regards to the assessments uh, in this course so it's all, it's all pretty exciting um, this is this is really cool stuff in production design and art direction it's all the planning and the exciting um, stages at the beginning of a production when you're using your imagination your your passion and your inspiration and, and your art skills as well so for me this is this is the pointy end of, of productions and it's the, it's the really fun part um, <clears throat> So I just need to refresh my screen. Um, so <clears throat> the purpose of today's lecture, I'm sorry about the random graphic. I sometimes, if I haven't got an image that's appropriate, I just put in something that's random. Um, so we'll talk about why you're doing this subject. We'll get into the, the nitty gritty of what um, production design actually is a little bit later. Um, we'll go through, I'll talk about what we're going to be covering in the course in the subsequent weeks. And of course, I'll be going through the assessments with you. So we'll do a quick assessment overview uh, this week and then what I'll do is each uh, so then next week I'll do a more thorough investigation of assessment one because that's the one that's due in first and then once assessment one has come in then we'll spend the, the week after that going through assessment two and then when assessment two comes in we'll spend a week going through what's expected in assessment three so basically there will be um, quite a lot of support for you going through with the assessments um, I'll also be explaining why it, my background and how it's relevant to this subject and um, how this subject fits into the degree that you're doing, which is important for you to know. Um, you know, you, you've always got to know context about what you're learning. That's very important. Uh, you'll be finding out what, um, what I'll be expecting from you guys, um, what you'll get from the course um, at the end, and uh, why, uh, this is quite important too, why there's overlap between subjects. Uh, some students say, oh, you know, we covered storyboarding in blah, blah, blah. We don't have to do it again. Um, it's, it's because if something does come up a few times and there is overlap, it's because it's really important. And uh, that means it's something that you, you can't practice enough of, like, you know, drawing, you know, storyboarding. Um, quite often I'll be talking to you about um, doing thumbnailing, uh, thumbnail drawing. Um, if any of you are um, interested in art and drawing, hopefully you all are. Um, <clears throat> thumbnailing is is a, is a really wonderful tool, whether you're a, a fine artist and you're outdoors painting and sketching or whether you're a, a high-end 3D animator, you'll be doing little tiny drawings to, to work things out at a small size very quickly before you commit yourself. So a lot of the time I'll be coming back to thumbnailing and then you might hear other teachers talk about thumbnailing as well. It's not something that you can just silo into one area. A lot of the things that we talk about will actually have a lot of crossover with other areas, which is really kind of cool as well, is when you make those, those connections. Okay, so we're going to launch into it. Um, so basically, just to give you a, a broad overview of what, what the course is when we're talking about um, production design and, and art direction. So the main thing I want you to get out of this course is to know what the role is of production designer. Art director tends to be the person that is in charge of the art department, but the production designer will be the person who will make um, <clears throat> all of those, those hard decisions uh, about the production, like colour styling, um, genre, the look and feel. Um, it really is the exciting part of, of the production. So you'll be uh, introduced to the, the, the theory behind um, production design, um, and especially things like... Um, uh, investigating uh, resources, what your inspiration is, and how to how to resource effectively is a, is a big thing. Um, a lot of people tend to go down the same route. Every time you research something, you'll tend to go to your favourite um, 
uh, website, be it you know, DeviantArt or you're just do a Google image search for something. Um, <clears throat> what we want to try and do is break that mold a little bit so that you're looking outside of your, your specialist areas or the areas that you're most used to going to. And just to try and break that down a little bit. And the idea of that is I want to try and get you guys to tap into something that's unique uh, in what you do and the way that you think and bring that to your production work, bring that to your animation work, bring that to your storytelling. Story is always king. Uh, what we do in the animation and uh, uh, creative industries area is that we, we visualise other people's um, dreams or ideas or stories or we come up with those ourselves and we, we work on those. But it all comes back to the story. And that's something that I'll keep on, I'll keep banging on about until you get quite bored of it. Um, so that is that is going to be the, um, um, the gist of what you're going to be uh, learning. Now, with regards to creative methods, um, I don't know where you guys are at in terms of your, your drawing skills or even whether you're, you're passionate about drawing or whatever it is. It might not be drawing. It could be ceramics. It could be, you know, I've had students who are really into Lego. It doesn't matter. These are all creative areas. To, to teach people to become a production designer in 12 weeks is, is, is pretty ludicrous. But what we can do is we can give you an overview of it, understand what the role is, understand how to go about these things. And we can do some drawing as we go. So when we have um, our one-on-one -on -one meetings, what, one thing I want to uh, get from you guys is, is where you stand with your, your art skills and then see what we can do um, maybe each week after we do our lecture. Um, what I did for the previous class was we did some drawing time after the lecture. And that would be me either showing a video and then uh, we do some drawing based on what we've learned in the video or I do a little demo and we, we follow on from that. Um, some of the exercises, they're not very hard. It's all just about getting confidence up. But I want to know where you guys are at. So if anyone there is a, is a really um, kick-ass drawer, I want to know about it. Uh, if anyone's, um, you know, a bit, a bit rusty or concerned about learning to draw, I want to know about it because we can fix that as well. Um, I, I love drawing. It's something I do um, all the time and I did it for many years. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot... There's a lot that you can learn about composition and about design um, <clears throat> almost innately just by the act of drawing. And it's very hard uh, to put that into, uh, into words and quantify it. But I think I've got something a little bit later on in this, this lecture that talks about drawing. Um, <clears throat> drawing is something that I'm going to continually you know, bang on about. If you're, if you're doing animation, um, drawing is going to help you whether you're doing 3D animation, whether you're doing uh, you know, just concentrating on visual effects, it doesn't matter. Everybody that I know in the industry that, uh, you know, has really, is good basically, they all have outside art interests apart from what they do uh, for their job. So they're, they're into, you know, um, music or painting or sculpting or ceramics or something, you know, and, and you're actually training to become animation artists. And this particular slice that we're learning here, the production design and art direction, this is very, very heavily art focused. So I guess I didn't want to ski you off and say we're going to be doing a lot of drawing because the, the last assessment for this uh, course does require some artwork. Uh, but that's going to be geared to what, where you're at in terms of your level, which is another reason why I want to get to know each other, uh, get to know you a bit better. Okay. Um, so what I want to do is quickly take you through um, very high level sort of stuff, what we're going to be doing in terms of the assessment. And the first assessment is, is very, very easy. It's very easy and very enjoyable. It's a blue sky mood board, which you're going to create in Pinterest. Um, it's, a, it's as simple as that. And we will talk more about this next week in detail. But basically, it will be you starting on the road to coming up with a way of visualizing an idea. Now that idea um, you have to come up with as well. So before the first assessment is due, uh, when you do your Blue Sky mood board, you will actually um, have an idea. Now what I might do is, uh, what, what we found last time was that if people didn't have a very strong idea at the very beginning, it actually made it hard for them later on. So we'll lock off um, sometime in the first week or two, what 
your brief is going to be. So, for example, you might want to do something that's post-apocalyptic. Um, it's, it's an imaginary project, so you're not actually going to make it. You're just going to do some um, production designs for it. So post-apocalyptic, you know, a, a ruined toy shop, and there's a, a little robot or something like that. Okay, so there you've got, a, you've got a genre, you've got look and feel, you've got a whole lot of um, uh, information there. If any of you are having trouble getting a, a brief together, um, we'll put our heads together and come up with one and just lock it in. It doesn't really matter what it is because it's not actually going to be made, like I said, it's just going to be something that you're going to be referring your three assessments to. Okay, so I wouldn't, wouldn't stress out about it too much. Um, <clears throat> just, just sort of take it easy this week and next week we'll be talking uh, more full on about assessment one. But basically you'll just be, you'll be collecting stuff on Pinterest and just writing uh, a little bit uh, about what, what you've collected. Um, the second presentation will be a, a refinement of the first assessment basically and with a little more in terms of notes and a short presentation. So that's basically all it is. So you'll be re refining. The first assessment is very, very broad and I expect you to collect a lot of uh, images that you might not even use in your last assessment and ones that are, that are very out there. So for example, you might be looking at something that is very mechanical uh, in terms of its um, storyline, <clears throat> but you might also investigate um, natural formations like corals or something like that just just because you like something about the structure or you like something about the lighting in some other images or something um, we'll be talking a lot more about this but uh, information collecting is very very important because this is your chance to bring in something that's going to take you off on a slightly different tangent to what you're normally used to uh, and that's super important for you as as artists and as animators coming into the industry, <clears throat> you need to uh, sort of decide fairly early on that you want to be someone who does work that's of high quality and that you'll be known for doing work of high quality. You don't want to be the sort of person who, you know, uh, sells themselves on being able to work cheaply. You want to be someone who's, who's got, you know, a good reputation. Um, so that, that's super important. Um, the third, just jumping to the uh, the third pre, uh, the third assessment, which is due in, in week twelve, will be uh, basically a final um, submission. It won't be a, a presentation; it'll just be a submission of your final um, production designs for your for your chosen brief. Okay, so again, it's important that you start thinking about a brief, just a little story um, <clears throat> or an idea that you can work on. It can be something that you're intending to use maybe in, in your college uh, days, um, something that you want to develop, or it could be something very um, simple or generic. Um, you could even look on Netflix or something like that and just look at the log lines of something quite random and obscure and just use that as a starting point for a... Um, you know, for an idea, you know, a spaceship crashes in the Amazon. Okay, you've already got a, a starting point. You could weave in ancient cultures. You could weave in, uh, you know, you've got the sci-fi. You've got the natural formations and things. So there's a lot of there's a lot of different ways that you can go uh, to to source something. Okay, but again, we'll be talking more about these as we go. Don't worry about the assessments too much at the moment. Um, the first two are easy. The last one's hard. Um, and yeah, just make sure you you keep doing. Um, working on your assessments bit by bit. Uh, I just want to go through you, with you quickly what we're going to be talking about over the, the 12 weeks. This may change slightly, but uh, it should be uh, relatively stable. Um, okay, so today's introductory. Uh, next week, as I said, we'll, we'll recap on assessment one. Um, we'll try every week as well. What I try to do is to look at an existing production, uh, something that's been done. We'll go through, we'll analyse it, we'll maybe look at some interviews with people who've worked on it, that kind of thing. Um, so they'll tr probably happen every week. Um, next week, we'll be talking mostly about inspiration and research techniques. Um, we'll be looking at mood boards and what sort of, um, uh, you know, what sort of things we're looking at for that first assessment. Okay, now we'll be coming uh, to the drawing side of things. Uh, we'll be doing drawing, uh, thumbnail drawing. Um, and as such, uh, just to let you know, what I tend to do after the lecture is I'll, um, I'll PDF the lecture um, PowerPoint slides and then I'll email those to you. And if I have any uh, brainwaves about the following week, I'll, I'll tend to write in those emails, you know, oh, by the way, next week, bring your drawing materials. Uh, what I might just say straight up is, Try to have something every week whenever you're doing a, um, a lecture with me. Just try to have a drawing pad next to you and um, 
it's a good thing to do anyway. You might find that you just start drawing spontaneously, which is really cool. That is absolutely great. I'm really um, uh, happy to um, encourage that. And also we may do some specific exercises. So we might just look at some shapes and characters and, and that sort of thing. Um, and also do some um, fun exercises as well. There's some really cool drawing games that you can, that you can do that are, are quite good fun. So I don't want anyone to be, to be worried about that. This is a, this is a, spa, uh, a, a safe space. So with your drawing, I really want to build your confidence. If you, if you have um, uh, confidence problems with your drawings, you don't have to show them to the class if you don't want to. I encourage you to because this is all part of, of doing that. But the thing is you can do whatever you want safely without feeling like, oh, I've just done a really shit drawing and I've got to show everybody. Uh, you don't have to do that. Um, that, that's my job. So if I do a crap drawing, I, I tend to show everybody. Um, I haven't rigged up a second camera to have a, um, uh, a, a dedicated uh, webcam on my drawing pad i'm just getting the um because i live um in mount tambourine in uh, in queensland we're only just getting the mbn now and it's sort of in, i'm in that stage where everyone um has their system, their service mucked up so if it drops out that's uh, my apologies but hopefully they'll be sorted out by next week um so then hopefully i'll have a um, um a webcam on my uh, my my drawing pad or my tablet whatever i'm using and uh, we can do some drawing exercises um so that will be super super exciting actually uh if anyone's got any problems with that that's something we can talk about one-to-one -one. you can email me anytime um i'm very foolish i put my uh, mobile number into my um email signature uh, so if you need to you can text me um, if you've got a question or something like that that's quite okay um, right so just moving on from um, uh, from that just talking about the um, uh, the weekly weekly schedule so cloudy with a chance of meatballs too is something that um, I just use a lot in a few examples just because there's so many good examples of great um, production design in that. Uh, so that's a, a movie I would like you to see at some stage um, in the next couple of weeks. I'd also like you to see The Incredibles too, because that's something that we talk about a fair bit in the later weeks when we're talking about environment design. Um, so these are the sort of things that I will um, pop down, you know, drop down in the email um, that I that I send to you on a Tuesday night. So please make sure you check your um, college email or um, go into your um, go into your college email and set up a rule or something to forward it on to your other address because it's just so much easier for me to, to grab out of the system all of your email addresses um, uh, in, in one sort of one go um, and it's just easier than mucking around with um, uh, your personal email addresses. Having said that, if you email me from your personal email address, I'll probably reply to that address. So once, but the thing is you may miss out on something. If I send out an email to everybody that has some important information and you're used to me toing and froing on your personal email, you may miss out on that. So just, just make sure that you check out um, your collats email. I know it's a pain having different emails. Um, I've got about three and I, get, I tend to, um, neglect one or two um, so please please get on to that um, I want to spend quite a lot of time talking about composition so you'll notice from week three to five we're going to be talking about a comp composition one two and three um, that's because composition is such an important thing and we don't know that we're automatically doing a lot of the things that are involved in creating good composition without even thinking about it. Uh, so this is where we break it down, and it's a really, it's 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 probably yeah my favourite section of the lectures is where we break down all the composition um, rules and tips and tricks and things and start bringing them together. Uh, we'll be endeavouring to have a, a guest lecturer in week six. I've got someone in mind who is a. Um, he's a high end matte painter. He now lives in uh, he lives in Vancouver. I think think so he's in Canada there's a lot of visual effects work going on in Canada um, something you will get to talk about too is where the jobs are happening and that sort of stuff so we talk a lot about industry stuff in this subject as well so I'll be giving you links to industry websites um, and that sort of thing and they're really important to have a look at if you're serious about getting into uh, the industry um, so, so we'll do the three uh, lectures on composition, the guest lecture, and then we'll do two, two weeks talking about environment design. Um, then in week nine, we'll do the presentation. So the, the, pre the assessment two is during week eight. You'll notice we're doing the presentations for that assessment the following week. That's because I think the assessments are due at midnight on Sunday night. 
and then we have a lecture on Tuesday night, so I figure we might as well do the presentations then. So you actually do the presentation after you've handed it in. We'll talk about that later. It's no big deal. Um, online presentations are very easy, um, and everyone went really well last time. Um, so then we're going to do two weeks looking at character design, and then the final week will be a, a review, and basically just contextualising everything for you and, and just, you know, just... Uh, sometimes things come up and just depends if there's something we need to talk about that week we can do it if people want to ask about the industry or anything like that that's all that's all good right uh, I better better start moving along I tend to overrun a little bit so I'll just pick up the pace of frag um, so we're still with the same number of people great okay now I just wanted to clarify with you what we mean when we talk about production design and when we talk about art direction um, traditionally, they would have been the same person. So the production designer and art director would have been the same person pretty much up until the, the filming of Gone with the Wind. And here I've included some images from a coloured storyboard showing the, the sequence which was known as the burning of Atlanta. Um, this, these, these are really cool images actually because they're, they're very, you can see they're very loose um, sketches with some watercolour. Uh, on the on the paper, but they're very they're quite moody and evocative and quite successful in conveying information rather than being just pretty pictures. And this is what we always come back to in production design is conveying information, supporting the story, telling the story, not just being a pretty picture. Uh, very very important point. So uh, up until the uh, to that point, um, gone with the wind. You pretty much just had art directors. Uh, nowadays, you tend to have a production designer would be the person who does most of the artwork, who who sets the, the style of the production, uh, who sort of uh, comes up with the uh, the look and feel, and that's a term that you should all be uh, familiar with. The art director would be the person who would be directly under him or her and would be responsible for the running of the art department so carrying out those those things so i tend to ignore art director as a role um, <clears throat> if you're working on a a, 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 sh a small project that you're working on with yourself by yourself or just with a couple of people you may tend to be doing both of those jobs yourself anyway so you will be the art director you will be the production designer you'll be the character designer the background designer all, everything. Um, so we cover all of that under the uh, under the umbrella of production designer. So just with that qualification and just to make it easier, so I just refer to production designer from now on, but understanding that that can mean art director if it's a big production that has a uh, budget that allows for, you know, those extra, extra staff. Uh, right, uh, just another image from Gone With The Wind, just showing another. Um, Another image which clearly, uh, clearly shows, you know, staging and perspective, uh, colour. Yeah, there's a lot of information. We'll come, we'll come to these things uh, one by one. But uh, whenever I see, you know, good examples of uh, things that come together and, and uh, I'll, I'll try and point those out to you. And so these examples of these very early, very old storyboards from what, the 30s or something like that, there's just so much information that you can get from that. Uh, in fact, a lot of, a lot of uh, feature films today wouldn't have storyboards that would be this, um, this full on, a lot of live action. Uh, there tends to be more effort, you know, obviously going into animated, animated productions because a lot of it has to be designed rather than just uh, you know, uh, filming something or using a live action set. Um, so yes, if there's something you don't understand, please feel free to ask if anyone's got questions during, I don't mind with a small group of people if you want to ask questions during the lecture, that's, that's probably fine. We will stop and have a chat at, uh, in a minute anyway. Um, so just talking about what, what a production designer is, what are the roles of the production, production design and responsibilities, so, as I mentioned before, uh, responsible for the visual, the look and feel of a production. Um, so, that means working very closely with the director and who would be working very closely with the, the script writer, perhaps. Sometimes directors just take a script and then don't involve the script writer anymore. That just becomes a visual medium. So, uh, so then they'd be looking at, okay, well, how do we visualise this? How do we go into the storyboard stage? Um, do we do some pre-production art? you know establishing the look and feel um, and this is quite important here too the the interpreting the script in visual metaphors um, this comes down to basic storytelling and we'll talk a lot about uh, 
you know, metaphors and, and uh, uh, shape language and things like that later on in this lecture series, which actually will make this a, a bit more, uh, make a bit more sense. So what that means is that you can actually use metaphors to, uh, to encapsulate ideas um, in a way that is quite quick and concise, especially if it's a visual metaphor. It's something that someone will see and, and it'll immediately trigger something. So it could be, for example, in the image on the right, there are a lot of verticals, a lot of buildings with columns and that sort of um, stentorian sort of architectural design, um, the very basic, I think this is from Hercules or something. Um, you know, so that, that's a sort of a signifier of, of a place in time uh, and maybe an authoritarian uh, culture. You know, there's lots of, there's, there's cues there to be had. Um, and we'll get more into that. So color choices as well. Um, this things like color choice and metaphor, uh, shape language, this stuff it really comes down to psychology. It's there's a lot of psychology in there as well, how, how this stuff works. And when you listen to interviews with people who are working on uh, these big films, uh, Pixar films or Disney films, uh, the little choices that they make, they will sit down and they'll have a meeting about the smallest little thing, and you'll think, well, that doesn't really matter. But the reason behind it, their reasons for doing something, will have a very sound psychological basis for it. Um, so that that's really exciting as well. Uh, so also uh, any architectural and period details that would come down to you know your genre, your setting, and again going back and serving the story, whatever the story is, where the where it's set. Uh, the uh, production designer also would generally um, either use a character designer or will design characters themselves, or maybe just come up with the first realization of that. Um, I, I just suddenly popped in my head a good example of that would be a guy called Ralph McQuarrie who, who worked on the very first um, Star Wars films with, um, with Spielberg and in fact it was his paintings that Spielberg presented that he actually got the funding to go ahead with the project uh, and he did the first um, uh, depictions I guess of the main characters. Uh, Luke Skywalker was originally a female. Um, uh, Chewbacca looks almost, almost had like this sort of bug-eyed insect head. Uh, really interesting. But C-3PO has almost not changed at all. And he based C-3PO heavily on a character called Maria the Robot from a film called Metropolis. Does anyone know Metropolis? Have you heard of Metropolis? It's by a, a German director called Fritz Lang. And it's very important in that a lot of filmmakers reference that film. Even if you watch the film like I did and go, I didn't actually like that very much. It is so important to other filmmakers, you will constantly see it being referenced. It's, it was referenced in uh, Dark City. It was also referenced heavily in Mad Max uh, Fury Road. There's scenes with the big cogs and those, those men pulling the levers and, you know, when the water's coming down, um, you know, that's, that's pure. That's pure Fritz Lang. Anyway, I digress. Uh, so the production designer works very closely with the overall director. Okay, so basically the, the beating heart of the production in its artistic and its visual sense is, is the production designer. Okay. Now, there's an interview here with um, Michael Korinsky from Sony Pictures. I'm not going to play it for you because I um, haven't had much luck with, um, with streaming at the moment. I'll try it again with a smaller file a bit later. Um, please have a look at this one afterwards when I send you the, um, the PDF. You'll have the link in there. Um, wherever I can, I try to include just little snippets, little interviews with people who are working in the industry, who are working on some big end stuff. Um, this might be out of the, you know, realistically out of the realm for, um, for some of you, but then may, maybe not, you know. Uh, but what's really interesting is when you hear these people talking about working as production designers for, for Sony or whoever, is, is hearing them talk about how they started and what they were like as kids and what things they did. And, that, and when you listen to these people, you go, you know, that's, that's just like me. I was just like that, you know. I just really wanted to do this you know, a very visual person wanted to draw all the time. Uh, you know, so you can sometimes get clues as to where your passions uh, may be leading you uh, when you listen to other people talk about their journeys. Um, so that, that's a super important part of this course is actually learning about as many production designers as, as you can. So I'll be, try, I'll be talking to you a lot about different production designers um, and, and sort of just touching on others. So you might think, oh, gee, I don't know any production designers, but you, you all know, you know, Tim Burton. You know, you know a Tim Burton film when you see that's a really extreme example of a production designer who 
puts their stamp all over the look and feel of a film. I can look at one scene from a, a Tim Burton film and go, and, and it'll just because there'll be something in the background with a little curl in it, you know, like that, that spiral. And that's a motif. That's kind of a metaphor or an emblem or a system or a logo that he uses that sort of signifies, okay, this is a Tim Burton film. And then you might have um, all of the Alien films and they've got the imprint of H.R. Geiger, um, who was the original production designer on that, and also Ron Cobb, who did the, the hardware. But, you know, uh, the, the Geiger stuff has a real look and feel to it. And when you look at his paintings, you then look at a film that he's worked on and you can see that, you can see that connection. So these are really um, super important, these, these interviews. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to stop. Um, I want to play this interview because I really like Aurora Jimenez and she talks about, um, she's in, you know, there's just a small interview, it's about five minutes long, um, about how she got into production design. And she actually made a little animation to go with the uh, interview, which is really sweet. And she's got a fantastic style. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, click on this. Now, Bear with me. If it doesn't, if if the streaming doesn't work and it's it's laggy, um, look, that's okay. It's it's just make sure the dialogue is coming through. If the dialogue's coming through, I'll stop it. If not coming through, I will stop it. But if the dialogue is playing smoothly, uh, we might just listen to it because it's worth just listening to uh, to what she has to say. So I'm just gonna have a go at um, at just streaming this YouTube video. Let's close down everything else. <laughs> I am Aurora Jimenez and I am a visual development artist here at Sony Pictures Animation. I grew up in Madrid, Spain. My parents were very supportive. My mother, she wrote poetry and she used... Are you guys at least able to hear that smoothly? Great, okay. ...to draw and my father, he's a comic collector, so he was giving me all his comics growing up. My parents had a bookshop and they sold all kinds of books and comics and art supplies. My sister and I, after school, we had to kill time until they closed the shop. So we just draw <laughs> and read and paint. All the awesome stories I read, I was visualizing every character, even designing extended stories for those characters, so I had a lot of fun. When we were on family holidays, we had to drive from Madrid to Cadiz in the south of Spain, and that is 400 miles. So my father came up with the stories while driving the 400 miles. It was something very interactive. He let us help him telling the story, so that was a lot of fun, actually. I think that the fact that we could contribute to the stories, that helped me a lot for later on coming up with my own characters and my own worlds. I wanted to be an artist, so I went to study fine arts. One of the subjects at the university was video art and computer animation, and I loved that class. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I want to do that. I want to work in, in animation. After I got my degree in fine arts, I still wanted to do something related with animation. But the thing is, in Spain, there was no school for that. So I thought, OK, I can apply my knowledge in drawing and painting to film school. So I went to get my degree in art direction for film. I learned how to tell stories visually. In the long run, that's helped me a lot, because I could apply directly what I learned in the film school to animation. After graduating, I work in an animation company that was doing TV animated series. That was great because the art director mentored me. And he was teaching me how animation works, what is the pipeline, what is the process, so I could shadow him and learn all of that. I met my husband, Carlos, on my last year at the film school. And he's an artist too. He was studying uh, art direction too. So since then we've been together. The thing of dating another artist is that the whole life becomes artistic. We are challenging each other all the time and learning from each other all the time. I wanted to work on more movies and in, at that time in Spain there wasn't very many animation companies so I decided to try abroad. So we moved to London and we ended up working in the same movie together, The Tale of Despero. One thing an artist has to be is open to explore, and traveling helps you to do that. When we finally moved to the US, my first job was in electronic arts, actually designing characters and environment for some of their games. And that was a great time, and I got to learn something new. By that time, I had worked in so many different platforms, like movies, commercials, TV series, and now video games. And I really love to learn how to apply my knowledge. I learned that 
Kelly Asbury was making a movie here at Sony Pictures Animation, so because I really like his work, I decided to apply to Sony and try to work with him. So I came for the interview and Michael Kurinska, a production designer, saw my work and he loved it. So he offered me another job in a different movie, Hotel Transylvania 2. And he told me, you know, Gendy is the director. I was like, oh no, really? <laughs> I love his work. So it's what I did for a year, working with them in Hotel Transylvania. Hotel Transylvania 2 has lots of new environments. The first assignment I had is designing the monster camp. So I had to design from the big valley with the mountains, the forest, the lake, to the really, really small things the characters are using in the scene. Also, we have other environments, more human environments, and it was very fun to, to design for humans versus monsters, because we had to come up with different shape language and different ideas for them. After working at Hotel Transylvania 2 for one year and a half, I got the chance to work in the newest Smurfs movie, with Kelly Asbury. This movie is an uh, all-animated movie and it's more close to the comic books from Peyo that I used to read when I was a kid, so it's quite exciting. I'm designing the, the worlds where the Smurfs are. It reminds me of my childhood when I used to play with the little figurines of the Smurfs. It's really great. I love the shape language. I love the style. It's cute and charming. What I like of working at Sony Pictures Animation is that I never got to work in the past with so many women artists. Here at Sony you have from the head of the studio, directors, production designers, visual development artists, even storyboard artists. It's really great to be surrounded by these talented women, learning from them and making friends with them. Sony Pictures Animation is a fairly small studio, so you get to know everybody. You get to work with artists who you admire, but you can call your friends because you have the opportunity to meet them every day, work with them and, and learn from them. So I'm pretty happy to be spending my whole day in that world. Cool. Okay. What a, what a great uh, childhood she had. I mean, um, her parents owned a bookshop and her dad collected comic books. <laughs> Um, pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and interesting to see too, the path that she took was through studying. So, um, and then, and, and interesting what she said too about uh, something an artist has to be, is to be open to new ideas and traveling is something that helps that. Um, I, I recommend doing travel as well, just as part of your overall, um, development as an artist, looking at as, as many different things as you can. Um, Something that was always a bit of a given when, when I was starting out was that you would have to go to where the jobs are. Um, so, for example, if you wanted to work in 2D animation, probably you would have to go to Melbourne, although, you know, we now have Bluey happening in Queensland. Um, that sort of uh, doesn't, doesn't really translate these days or it's not... Uh, I mean, you can work remotely and a lot of people say, oh, you know, I want to be able to live in Darwin and I want to be able to be a production designer. Well, you know, there's, uh, you may have to go traveling first and get some experience before you set up and work on your own. Um, usually that's the way you go if you want to end up being a freelancer or if you want to work for a big company, then you definitely have to go where the work is. That's, that's something that we're, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about a bit later as well. So here's some more of uh, Aurora's work. Uh, and I wanted to show you the diversity of it because she, uh, something that she's amazing at is actually not just being one uh, style of artist and so not just be someone who's doing characters or just doing background. She can do pretty, pretty much everything. Um, and this is this is amazing as well. Just lovely loose loose style. Her illustrations are uh, fantastic. Okay. Now, as I mentioned before, if you're working on a, a small production or auteur, as um, as they say in France, if you're sort of like a, a one a one person band and you're making your own production, basically, you know, you will be doing both roles: um, uh, production designer and art director. And even if, even if it's just a small a small team, again. Art direction is something that comes in when you've got a much bigger budget and more, more time. Um, I mentioned before about the importance of drawing and how um, how much I uh, like it and also the value of it. And 
all of the people um, <clears throat> that you'll be seeing in those little interviews and that, they're pretty much, you know, obsessed visually one way or another with creating, um, whether that's through drawing digitally or, you know, using pastels or watercolour or oil paints or whatever. It, it doesn't matter. And what I'm hoping is that each of you will have something in your background, something you're really passionate about that we can bring, bring into, uh, you know, the current stuff that you're doing. The reason I like drawing is because without even doing anything else, if you just sit down and just make yourself draw and, you know, learn a few rules and, and try to base your drawing on observation um, to start off with. Uh, observational drawing and drawing from life is the thing that will make your uh, fantasy drawings, your cartoons, everything else uh, so much better. And that's why you do it. It's not because... Uh, you shouldn't do fantasy drawings. You should only draw what's in reality. It's just that that is the best thing for you to do. And the best kind of drawing you can do is life drawing. So that means going to a life drawing class and actually drawing from a, from a figure uh, is the best drawing you can do. Uh, that's something that I will be mentioning quite a lot. So uh, one thing that they used to say about drawing, and, and it's, it's quite true, I think, is that drawing actually teaches you how to see. Now, I can, the only way I can explain that is that when you draw something, you have to look at it in a very sort of analytic, analytical way and that forces you to look at it a bit more closely than you would normally. So just a normal household object like a chair or something or a, or a, you know, a mouse or something, if you sat down and, and drew it, you'd actually go, well, it's actually more complicated than I thought. You know, there are all these different angles happening here, but you know, when you look at it as one thing, there is a way of breaking it, breaking it down. So the observational skills that are brought to bear by drawing are really, really important. In fact, they did a recent study on people, I think they might have, they were geriatric people, and I think they might have had a cognitive impairment and they, they did a series of experiments and they got some people to go home and do, you know, like do a, a wee fit thing. Other people went for a walk in the park. Other people, you know, did something else. And then another group went to life drawing and they went, you know, just once a week, go to a life drawing class. It didn't matter what their ability level was, but the people who did life drawing made the greatest improvement in their cognitive function out of all the other groups. And there's something about the drawing act that actually really does um, kick into your brain or it, it just, you know, it, it's, uh, it triggers off um, neural pathways, I think, that you probably don't use or don't access in any other way. Uh, generally, you know, the, the thing people worry about most, they worry about things like uh, proportions and uh, perspective and stuff like that. When you draw on a regular basis, these things become much, much easier. And there's also lots of tips and tricks that you can learn. Uh, and I'll be trying to share as many of those with you as, as possible. Um, I mean, you can go into Photoshop and you go, oh, well, you know, I'm not very good at perspective, so I'll just, you know, I'll pull out a grid and I'll work to that. I think there's a lot of value in at least knowing how to do these things from scratch. Um, and, you know, and also be able to do it digitally as well. Um, so I think there's there's value in learning how to draw, even just from the from the ground up, even just you know two dots and just joining it in one stroke, getting that line confidence up, uh, super important. If you want to be an animator, you're going to be working digitally, you're going to be doing a very clean, smooth line uh, using your Wacom tablet. You know you need to practice that. You need to practice that um, the motion and the actual um, that to get that line confidence. Um, I'll be giving you lots of tutorials on this, this kind of stuff. So staging, anatomy, you know, if you draw from life, you will just start to know anatomy. You'll just start, your drawings will improve because you'll start to include things like, um, you know, proper uh, shoulder and hip width and things like this. And you, you don't necessarily analytically think, oh, okay, well now I'm doing the, the anatomy properly. It will just happen by osmosis. Um, so really what it's coming down to is, is that practice is the best thing that you can do. And if you don't, you don't have to sort of, you know, become a medical practitioner, learn the names of all the bones and muscles, but there are some key ones that you do need to know. And that will happen if you just go and do, uh, do life drawing. So, of course, you know, uh, character design, environment design, um, using, using tones to create mood, um, composition is king in terms of telling a story, leading the eye around the image. 
uh, manipulating the viewer, uh, and the idea of using thumbnailing for quick idea suggestions. So these, these are all the values um, of drawing, and I really, really strongly recommend it. Um, just to give you an idea, I did um, about 16 years uh, working in the, the 2D industry um, in Australia. So starting from in the late 80s working for Hanna-Barbera um, and then went overseas, worked for a few little companies and ended up working uh, on Balto actually with Simon. And so up until that stage, that was all hand-drawn. So that was um, so about 16 years of just, just doing hand-drawn 2D animation and working with people who were really shit hot artists and like I just totally shake my head these people were so good so you know I would try to learn as much as I could from these guys because I was a slow drawer I, I actually I had trouble uh, achieving my quota each week that's for sure so yeah um, there's lots of tips and tricks that you can learn and I'll be sharing sharing lots of those with you um, so my background is 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 in 2D animation, but I also went and spent five years after that working as a 3D uh, 3D artist for a, a computer game company. Um, it was Infograms, which then became Atari, and then I think it became Chrome. Anyway, um, so yeah, got a bit of 3D in there, and then I've done 10 years of um, lecturing um, at SAE, your your competitor. So here, here we are, that's, that's where I got to. But that's sort of to explain why I, I so in love with drawing and why I keep coming back to drawing. Uh, you can't beat it. Uh, these are some uh, background images. These were actually uh, just mood sketches because the final backgrounds are actually done in oil paints, but these were from the Balto film. So these were just little mood sketches. So this is to show you how much information, um, you know, the brief was, okay, well, it's a snowy town, you know, draw some alleyways. And it sounds like, well, it's pretty uninspiring, but when you think about it, there's lots of different ways you can create mood. And there's so many different examples of using uh, shape language in, in this. And this is something that we'll, we'll cover in a few weeks' time, um, coming back to this idea of small idea generation very quickly. Um, again, just some very quick shapes there. Um, just an idea of how, um, how drawing can be a very quick shorthand to idea generation. And a, um, I think a background sketch from Lion King, not sure, Disney, Disney background. How to Train Your Dragon. This is a sketch um, by a, um, a Disney animator called Glenn Keane. Has anyone ever heard of Glenn Keane? Any Disney fans? You're a Disney fan? <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, Glenn Keane's amazing. He did a lot of uh, work on Tarzan. Uh, he worked on a whole heap of stuff, but I like his Tarzan stuff, um, especially. Uh, with the idea of uh, this, this just shows you how um, what you are concentrating on as production designers really is the, the simplified image on the right. If you take the, the, the left-hand images and then the right-hand images, which is like a breakdown, uh, really what you need to concentrate on is the planning, is the way the eye is directed around the image. And you can see by the use of arrows there. So the top image there where you've just got the row of soldiers, you've got the red carpet, that's a simple use of one-point perspective and it's designed to lead the eye you know, to one, one spot. Um, and this, this is the sort of thing you're going to, to learn, not only in this subject, but also when you do cinematography and storyboarding. You'll be learning things like, uh, you know, shot direction, uh, more about leading the eye and telling, telling the story. And you'll be making a decision about, well, no, we don't want this uh, shot to be, to be that simple. We want there to be something else happening that leads the eye in a bit slower rather than just one point perspective going straight down the barrel. And once you know more about these uh, these basic tools, you can play with them a bit in order to tell your story in a different way. So always coming back to the story. So all of these images here relate to uh, conveying the information to the next person down the line in the production or to the audience itself. So it's all about visual communication. So, and that's something that I, I try to um, try to bring home very, very early on is that this this idea of yes you're doing drawings and yes it's it's great if they look nice but the most important thing is do they 
tell the story? Do they do the job that they're uh, supposed to do? That is the most, most important thing. Okay, now what I've given you here are some uh, resources to have a look at, so please do check these out in your own time. Um, these are general ones to do with uh, production design. Okay, so each week, what I'll tend to do at the end is give you a, a slide that has lots of uh, um, resources in it. It'd be great if you could have a look at those. Um, I tend to collate them and give them to you again at the end of the, the lecture series. But you'll get the most benefit out of this course if you do this as we go, because it's sort of incremental and it sort of builds on what you do one week will build on what we've done the week before. So it'd be really good if you could have a look at that. Uh, and just just be familiar with some of these um, some of these websites. Okay, now, arigato au revoir, and uh, I put, always put that in there because um, whenever I travel overseas, I always make a beeline for comic book shops or art supply shops. And uh, in France, uh, I was in a comic book shop and I heard someone shout out arigato au revoir, and I just thought that was really sweet. The combination of Japanese and French and the the fact that you know nerds are the are nerds wherever you go in the world and i love, I love that combination of, of the language um so really uh, so that that's it for the uh, theory uh, this evening what i wanted to do was to um because there's, there's only the four of you here this evening is um first of all do does anyone have any questions any questions about the course any questions about um animation in general or the industry or anything Anything they wanted to know but were too scared to ask, um, I'm right here. Come on, surely, surely there's, there's at least one question. Well, let, let me start by asking, asking you, um, why are you doing, uh, doing animation? Let's start with Hunter, because I can see you, Hunter. Uh, <laughs> um, well, for exactly all the reasons that you've been talking about, like mm -hmm. being able to take what's in my head and express it properly through a visual medium. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a really cool idea to me. All of this sounds amazing to me. Oh, great. Yeah, being able to create worlds and, and people and structures and um, yep. creatures. And I really yeah. like the idea of that um, and the stories that, that are around them. I, yeah, I just love it. That's, yeah. Great. So what are your favourite uh, animated films or TV series? What sort of, you mentioned you like Disney? Yeah, I love Disney. I think, yeah, and Pixar. I mean, I just feel like they never get it wrong. Like, from, like everything from their storylines to their soundtracks to their, the way they design their characters, their worlds, mm -hmm. their animation, mm -hmm. everything is always so coherent and... Um, yeah, and their stories are just beautiful. Like they could tell the same kind of story ten times, and it would be—it's excellent <laughs> every yeah. time. You know, I, th I think they have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you're, you're right. You just can't fault. You just can't fault the artwork, and and everything is, is so finely crafted as well. And you know, the the finest decisions about you know the positioning of something in in shot. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating to break it down, actually listen to them talking about, um, oh, I just they think about one example would be, and I think it was might be pre-Disney when uh, Brad Bird was talking about working on The Incredibles and these whole sections that he was really, really invested in at the storyboarding stage, which they turned into an animatic. And he... he had to get rid of this stuff and he didn't he didn't want to so he had to fight it was his he was fighting against himself in a way because he wanted to put all this this stuff in but it wasn't serving the purpose of the of, of the film mm. but um the amount of the amount of toing and throwing uh, that they were sort of going into about this scene it was just when, when they were trying to reveal that uh mike parr had the uh, Mr. Incredible had the superhero powers and it was meant to be at the barbecue and he was chopping up some things and he took his eye, he had a meat, he had a cleaver and was chopping meat and he took his eye off what he was, what he was doing and then started chopping his fingers up. But what happened was the, the knife got little notches in it. Uh, <laughs> Cause obviously, you know, he's, he's, you know, Mr. Incredible and someone saw this happen and started screaming 
And it's like, oh, but his fingers were safe. So, you know, Elastic Girl quickly spilled some sauce across his hand. So, <laughs> like blood. And he was like, oh, oh, no, we better just go home and fix this, you know. Um, and it was a really marvellous little sequence. But when you think about it, it was probably a little bit clumsy in terms of the flow of the film. And, and, and what was interesting was, was him talking about how invested he was in that idea and how much he loved it and how hard it was to let it go. So getting to that stage where you can be critical of your own work and, uh, you know, workshop ideas really quickly, not be too attached to them. It's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, a real, it's a real process. But this, this subject will then uh, lead on in a, in a way to the, the storyboarding subject. Um, because that sort of takes you down the next step in the production uh, pipeline. But um, no, that, that's very, very interesting. Um, is there anybody else into Disney apart from Hunter? You're missing out, guys. Missing out. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think in light of that? What do you think of the idea of Disney to turn their animated features into CG heavy live action slash live action? I this is contentious I know yeah like <laughs> the Lion King is my most favorite movie of all time like the 90s version and yep I actually read a Rotten Tomatoes review that described it perfectly I haven't I haven't seen the live action because I have a lot of feelings about it but yeah, yeah. Um, they said the best that this live action remake could hope to be is a copy of something that's already perfect and that's kind of how I feel about it. You know, it might yeah. be like beautiful aesthetically, but yeah. I just don't think you can tell the stories you can tell in the mm-hmm. 2D world with like such expression and such mm-hmm. personality. And, you know, it, if you take a real lion, it's beautiful, but yeah. you don't get that expressiveness and like that char- that sense of character. I'm talking out my ass because I haven't seen it, but I saw a trailer for it and I don't know. I don't know. I just... I don't know why they did, why they bothered doing yeah. that. You know? Yeah, that, that's my question is why? What was the reason yeah. behind it? Um, yeah, and it just has to come down to making money, which, yeah. which is, you know, yeah, I guess that's what they do, hey? Mm. But, um, yeah, I, in terms of the animation, though, I think the 2D animation, you're quite right, it has a, it has a charm and will always look hand made or looks like there's the hand of the artist is in there in in the decisions about the shape of the nose about the eyes about the expressions with the cg stuff it seems to be that one step removed a little bit from the the agency of the the artist or the director Mm. maybe that's just me um but yeah i i I don't know i i I would have to be forced at gunpoint i think to actually sit down and watch yeah yeah Yeah. i think about (laughs) with like film in general now like they're making you know 4k televisions and and Mm. it's almost like they're trying to break through that fourth wall in a way and try and make you feel like it's happening to you and and you're there in your not in your living room but you're in the scene or whatever and i don't know how i feel about that i feel like a lot of the romance is taken out of it you know by trying to make it so realistic um Mm. that you can't even like if you went to the zoo and watched a bunch of real lions walking around, you'd be like, "Well, they're beautiful, but <laughs> exactly, <just> sorry, <laughs> you know, like you can't, you can't go off. There's less left to your imagination, you know. Yes, and I, yes. I, I need, I need to be able to do some work myself. I, I, I agree. I think there's a charm. There really is a charm in the two D form that is, uh, it's irreplaceable. I think people are, re- are recognizing that now. Whereas there was this love affair with the, the 3D medium. And you're right, there seems to be, I think people are confusing reality and realism with believability. And mm. I think believability is more important. So I think you could have, you know, Disney animators animating a flower sack or a clock or a doorknob. more be- And those characters to me are more believable than some of these really bad CG characters where you just your eyes just drawn to the that little bit of geometry that doesn't quite work or (laughs) the dead-eyed stare you know when they try to do um motion capture and you know uh, performance capture yeah it's it it is interesting but uh, these decisions are are made and they're made by people who have the money and then they would go to a production designer and say 
okay, here's the job you're working on. We're going to do The Lion King, but it's going to be live action. And you're like, oh, my God, why are we doing this? <laughs> okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, the animated form, and particularly the more abstract it looks or the, the less realistic it looks, I think you get away with more. And I think that's why yeah. you, you'd never get away with South Park if it was realistic 3D. You know? Totally, totally. Uh, even go back in the old days, Roger Ramjet and, and cartoons like that. They, they work because they were written. Uh, the writing is good. Uh, I remember watching the... Oh, like an animatic of the first Toy Story movie. And I got so engrossed in it, I forgot I was watching an animatic. It was because the story was so good and the story yeah. was so strong that it just carried you along. And I was just totally believing in these little sketches. It's amazing what you just said about, like, believability and realism. Like, that is, those are the words for something I have not been able to find the words for, like, yeah. to describe... Um, even when you look at like Wally, the Pixar yes. film, yes, like yes. this little trash collecting robot um, mm. that cannot stretch and squish, you know, so they have to find a way to make you fall in love and, and humanize this little machine, you yeah. know, and without being able to d use like traditional animation tricks. And That's like, right. yeah. I would rather watch that, you know, because it's, you're not going to go outside and find a trash compacting robot with an adorable personality, you know, like, but I was in it for the time yeah. that I was watching it. I fell yeah. in love with this thing and I, you know, and the world that he's in and, you know, mm -hmm. like you're really right there. I think maybe that's the mistake that they're making is that they think that going closer to realism will make it more believable. Mm. Um, but you're right. It's way less forgiving because then people have, a comparison in their mind. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So um, then, then you have the the um, the uncanny valley that you you fall into, which is that when something becomes very very close to realistic, you notice the differences more. Mm. So, so for example, with something like you know the Polar Express, the, those horrible movies, like Beowulf, and things that were meant to be hyper realistic. But the more hyper realistic it is, the more you notice the things that aren't quite right. And that's exactly, totally. exactly what you're saying. So you're better off staying right away from it, being completely abstract, using using acting and uh, body language to convey most of your emotions. Uh, and and Wally's a good example of that. I mean, he's basically like an overhead projector. I mean, <laughs> what, what, I mean, the most unappealing character shape I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. But you're right. Within a very small amount of time, you do start believing in the world so you do have that believability because everything he does kind of reinforces that so you understand yeah. what his role is and he's actually involved in creating that landscape that those towers of, of trash yeah but because when we when we start talking about um color we, we talk a bit about wally and also the difference between the two worlds how the the, the world of wally on earth and the world of the humans on their spaceship okay. have totally different production design values, if you like, that they sort of meet. Mm -hmm. And even Wally coming together kind of brings those two worlds together. And there's interesting use of colour when that point of the movie actually occurs, the colour styling changes, which is really, yeah, really that's such a good point. So that, no, just, I don't, mm. How do they, like, one of the things I find interesting is, like, when you said post-apocalyptic toy shop, mm. like, that was awesome in my head. <laughs> you, can I use love, that. you can use that. Yeah. I love like broken, dusty, tattered stuff, you know. And yeah. I'm interested in like finding a way, like how, like in Wally, for example, Earth is like destroyed. Um, I liked the orbit of rubbish old satellites around the Earth. Uh, mm. when, you, when you'd see Earth, you'd see all these broken satellites. Like it was awesome. All the trash. Yeah, and I don't know how they made it so, like, desolate and appealing. You know, it's like mm. you, we're showing those alleyways. They look so lonely and cold but appealing, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in that, like, how to achieve that. And, oh, great. You know. Yeah, I think you'll really enjoy shape language um, because it's something that you it, – it's one of these things that's it's innate, and like you are saying before, something you always had in your head but never had the words for. When you look at shape language and you start to look at, you know, the use of – verticals, 
um, horizontals and diagonals and, and waveforms and arabesques and things like this, um, they all do different things and they all say different things in the, in, the, in the image. They lead your eye in different ways. So they can be used in different combinations to say different things. That's almost like words coming together to make a sentence and you can sort of rearrange them any way you want. So you can say whatever you want using shape language and using composition techniques. Um, and it's like a whole, it's like a whole new world opening up. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty I love cool. that. That's cool. awesome. Yeah. Um, so, so who, who else, who else wants to have a chat and tell me, tell me what, uh, what we're on about. Um, what about you, Suchu? Suchu? I'm trying to, trying to get your name. Suchu. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Suchu. Well. Suchu. Suchu. Well. Suchu. Well. I'll Suchu. try to update my, uh, <laughs> so that's okay i just want to get your get your name your name right um I've yeah talked i don't know for a long think, time um, yeah i'll update i'll update the uh yeah. no no worries just just to make it, make um, it for my, for my yeah program. i'm just uh, you know following through um mm -hmm. <laughs> what about uh, so what's your your inspiration for, yeah, for doing absolutely. animation no worries um i don't know you know what My expression, um, I, I came from a traditional, traditional art uh, background. Uh, I was a painter for a long time, uh, mm -hmm. you know, almost my whole life. And I um, accidentally uh, found uh, animation in 3D uh, yeah, a few years ago, and I just fell in love and I thought, oh, this is fantastic. I wanted to learn this. so. Um, I guess um, that the whole, you know, the whole story uh, the that involves in animation is what really attracts me. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any favorite uh, films or, or animators or production companies? Yeah. Um, it, well. Yeah, well, Disney, Pixar, all the uh, you know my uh, preferred company. Yeah, uh, yeah. Anim big animation companies, but yeah, my favorite animator happens to be my my teacher, uh, Mark. So you know, I couldn't be happier than that. Great. Is that Mark Pullybank? Yeah, I believe it is. Ah, okay, good. I haven't I haven't met yeah, him yet, yeah. but uh, that's great. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, okay. What about um, Tommy? Are you in a position to, to speak, Tommy? Yep. Hello. Hi. So, what's your Hi. what's your inspiration? Um, I actually so um, I found CG Spectrum first before I came to Call Arts. Okay. Um, and the reason was because I actually wanted to get into um, becoming a digital artist. Mhm. Mm um, but there was no government funding to it. So I had to, I guess, had to go with the bachelor degree. Um, and I've kind of just been um, exploring the industry and kind of just getting to know more about it. Um, okay. And yeah, this is just kind of my position right now. Sure. Um, the reason why I did it, I've just always been inspired by the work that people go through. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like people don't really understand how much goes into a production. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just really looking into it just inspires me. So. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I'm really into like the gaming industry. Mm -hmm. Um, I love Marvel. I love, um, all the CGI and all that kind of stuff. From that right. Stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you, I, I would say that you're probably more interested in, uh, like the visual effects side, the, the things, the more sort of, um, high I mean, we, we haven't, um, dived into it yet. It's all been about 3D um, animation and modeling so far. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I still don't have an answer for you, but um, yeah, I guess it's it's for me to figure out myself. So yeah, yeah. Well, I guess the good thing with this course is that you'll get to have um, you know a bit of a a chance to to build up those 3D and the solid um, skills in 3D modeling and 3D animation. And, and those will never, you know, that's never a waste of time, <laughs> you know, getting getting those things under your belt. And even if, you, if you're learning in Maya and then you get a job using 
um, 3ds Max or Softimage or something like that. It doesn't matter because you've been through the process, so you sort of know how to go about things, even if you're transferring to a different a different package. But, uh, no, that, that's that's good. It's good to have a different um, uh, a spread of interests within within the cohort. So that's good. Thanks, thanks, Tommy. Um, okay, Peter. Um, I've only spoken to you, I think, on um, email before. Did we have a meeting before? I helped you with an essay, uh, didn't I? I think it was just email. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty much the same as Tommy, except 3D modeling, prop artist, and um, environmental artist. Right. And I guess my inspiration would have come from video games, just right. growing up with them. Okay. That's fair, that's fair enough. So you, you see yourself getting into the, in the, in the industry by doing, you know, making assets um, yeah. and going through that way. That was, uh, when I was working in games, that was the traditional pathway for any artist uh, who came into the company. Uh, regardless of whether they would end up then working on, you know, racing cars or humans or, you know, uh, whatever, pretty much they would they would start off with the, the modelling and, and props. Um, and then, not that that was a unimportant job, it was just a good place to put people to start off with and then you could see what they were capable of doing. Um, that was the job that I did for, I think, about five, five years, was making, uh, you know, trees and rocks and hedges and racetracks and fences and skid marks and all these sorts of things that had to be put on a Formula One racing game. Um, so I did, I did that for quite some time, but it's a, it is a good launching point. And it's a good thing too in that it's probably the, the job that has the most uh, employment opportunities, I think, in games would be, you know, a, a good... If you're a good modeler, um, you, 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 you know, you pretty much... Get, giving yourself a, um, a backup career. Um, being able to model for games to being able to model very efficiently um, uh, and being able to make, you know, super, super cool low poly models um, is, is a really good skill. So that's, yeah, that's great. Cool. So are you a hardcore gamer, Peter? Uh, yes. So am I, going to be, <laughs> am I going to be competing with your game tournaments uh, for assessment time or? <laughs> uh, I'll try not to. <laughs> Multitasking. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I have two monitors. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> you have two monitors, yes. Uh, what are you playing at the moment? Uh, at the moment, I'm playing Borderlands 3, uh, WoW Classic. Okay. And I can't remember. I think Fermentide 2. Okay. Not Fortnite. No, uh, <laughs> that is not my style. <laughs> You'll be too old, too old for that. Uh, I just don't enjoy the Battle Royal. Type games. Oh, okay. Cool. Anybody else play games or uh, pretty much? What about you, Tommy? Yeah, you also a gamer? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, yeah, I love video um, games. I don't play anything at the moment, but um, I I love story play, uh, story driven games. Yeah, um, like me God too. War. God of War. is like one of my favorite games of all time. Spider Man, <laughs> PS4, uh, Red Dead Redemption, all that kind of stuff. I love the immersion and landscape and so story is quite important to you yeah, yeah I, I feel like it's like everything mm. great that's something that um oh we were talking about it um when i was down at actually went to call out in melbourne um a couple of weeks ago for a um just for a sort of a conferency thing and we're talking about uh you know what the different roles are and strengths and weaknesses and something that the Australian industry has always had, it's always been in animation, particularly in TV series animation, was we don't have very good writers and we don't have very good voice talent. And oh, that's something 100%. that... Yeah, we've been totally um, suffering from that for a long, long time. And that's starting to change a bit now. Um, but the idea is, you know, people come to Australia, they use this as kind of like a, um, uh, a factory for, for doing their projects because we're so good at what we do, but we're not doing our own intellectual properties. We're not doing our own stories. Mm. They tend to be, well, you know, we're going to do Aquaman here on the coast. I mean, Aquaman 2, Aquaman 3, you know, it's sort of more of the same. You know, I've got friends who are sculptors who work on, on those productions. Um, and it's really good, but I think we should be telling Australian stories. And um, what I really 
would rather see people do. And it's there's nothing wrong with getting a job at a big company and having a job and just being a you know a, a car modeler. That's that's fine. You could do that for years, but I would rather see you develop your own voices a little bit and have a uh, uh, have a little bit of an edge that comes from your backgrounds and it comes from your personality and your your experiences, your uniqueness. So your unique experiences will be, will be processed and then when you create a project, some of that will, will carry through. And we'll be talking about this a lot next week when we're talking about inspiration and one, uh, the, the old saying of garbage in, garbage out, we'll be talking about that a lot. If you look at the same things all the time and then you sit down to design a production, you're going to design something that pretty much looks like all those things that you've looked at, um, all the games that you've played, all the films that you've watched. If you push yourself out a little bit into some uncharted territory, you're going to benefit from it. And I can't explain it any more than that. And the only way you can do it is by trying it and then going, okay. So what I'm going to do is is give you things to, to watch, um, maybe people to check out, and they might not even be listed in the lecture. I've tried to put as much in the lectures as possible. But when I'm speaking, sometimes something will just pop up. And I just sort of, okay, Bill Plimpton is a, uh, an American cartoonist. He's very out there. He does all of his um, films. They're all drawn in 2D. He does them himself. And they are the most outrageous things you've ever seen. Um, but as an auto animator, I mean, that's, that's something that you can do. Uh, and it's so much easier nowadays, I think, with uh, digital distribution and all these different platforms. Um, yeah, so Bill Plimpton, um, just a, a crazy American animator who just, just sits and draws all day. Um, but, you know, he's got a very original way of looking at things. Um, and you can look at one frame. I can see one frame and go, yeah, that's a Bill Plimpton thing. Oh, I want you guys to sort of... Um, think, well, you know, why not aim for, for being your own idea generator and having your own industry and having your own job and, and, and having your own ideas that you, you can then work on? And if you end up working for someone else, sure, but, you know, but it's, it's good to have these projects um, of your own that you can sort of take through and, and, and work on. And I really encourage you to try, even when you're studying, is to try and have something for yourself. Uh, that you're you're working on, whether it's a sketchbook or whether you've got a you know you're writing down stories or you're you're just writing down as a as a diary what's happening, um, just keep creating, keep thinking creatively, and and try to um, try to develop your own ideas rather than thinking oh you know when when I get out of here I'll get a job working on you know like I say Aquaman seven um, mm -hmm. you know, painting scales. Um, <clears throat> Sure, that could that could be that could be a good and, and rewarding job, and as a fallback, it's not good. But why not be the person who designs the production? <laughs> mm. Why not shoot for the moon? Why not go for it? And and coming up with something unique and out there uh, is is much better than trying to copy you know, something that's been done a bit you know, a bit mundane. Anyway, but we'll we'll talk about this all the way through. So I try to try to give you inspiration as we go, and try to encourage you to. Um, um, to find your own voices a little bit and not just to be, you know, like me or, or, or whoever. So that's why I want to try and catch up with you one-on-one uh, -on -one and find out a little bit more about where you're going. And this helps me when I'm uh, when I'm researching for the lectures and I see something and I go, oh, yeah, 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 this is, this is something that, you know, that Hunter was telling, telling us about the other day or this is what Tommy was talking about. Um, so I'll put that in there because then it's something that relates to something we've already talked about. It's a, it's a better learning experience, that sort of stuff. So um, I will uh, make, a, make a point of contacting you. So when when I finish up tonight, I will um, email the uh, lecture slide uh, uh, PDF to you, uh, and I'll also I'll put down uh, just to remind you about the drawing materials for next week, and also to arrange a time to have a catch up with you during the week. Okay, so I'm even available on weekends. Um, most of you guys would be. Um,